Welcome to Access Church. We're stoked you're with us. Before we get into the teaching today, grab your Bible, your note sheet, and maybe your favorite beverage, and be ready to receive all that God has for you today. The King of all creation set aside his crown, a servant to the Father's love, descended from his throne above, author of salvation, giver of new life, crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness is in the Get those hands clapping. God of resurrection, conqueror of death, ruler over everything, the Lord of lords and King of kings is Jesus. Every heart and tongue confess your name. Sing this now, highly exalted. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus Christ. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth declare all praise. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus. Every heart and tongue confess your name. with me now. Grace rewrote my story. 
I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, oh, oh. oh. of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, He will. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. My story, I'm justified. Of Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, 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 oh. Now we all know this is true. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, no, you're not, Lord. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, Lord, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Yes, I do. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Testimony, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Give him praise. We have the true and committed here at church on a three-day weekend. Or you just couldn't travel, so you had to be here. You had no other choice, but we're glad. We're glad you're here. Um, all right. Hey, uh, before we kind of jump in, do you mind if I move this? Tie over? Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, just a few things going on here, and then we'll jump into groups. Uh, today is the last day of our, uh, of our series uh, in essential faith, and then we're going to jump into the book of Acts. I know a few of you are already starting to jump into Acts. I encourage you to start reading that book, start prepping the soil, getting it ready. Uh, we're going to be in that probably through Easter, so we're going to take a lot of time going through the book of Acts, so just a heads up on that. Uh, let me tell you what's going on. I might lose my voice, because last night was a wild night, so... If you uh, check out Facebook Live, one of our own, Ashley Hanley, uh, did some country singing last night in Old Town Temecula. So uh, we threw it out there for you guys. And, uh, uh, and so we packed it out. I think uh, they said it was the first sold out show ever. And that's because our church was like half the people there. So um, we had a great time supporting her. She killed it. So you can check out uh, the Facebook uh, group. And we put some live videos up there. Um, but with that, uh, here's some things going on. With us kind of moving into the book of Acts, we really want to kind of just get into the groove as church of um, being kind of that outreach mindset, but also behaviorally, not just thinking about it and talking about it, but, but doing it. So we're going to have some opportunities over the next several months. What we're going to do kind of organizationally, where we're going to kind of gather people, is uh, we're going to switch off uh, every other month. One month we're going to work with a local organization called SWAG. 
uh, Andrew, am I getting a little bit of feedback on this? Okay, you can play around with it because it's announcements. Nobody cares. So, uh, but get that because that'll bother me while I preach. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, so we're gonna be next. Is it Thursday? Is Laura Lee in here? Laura Lee, is it Thursday? Okay, Thursday. This so September we're gonna um, hang out with the homeless, and it's about an hour. It's real quick. Uh, Laura Lee and I did it though a few months ago. It's really cool. They have a great setup, very safe. But we help bring a potluck meal, and just make them feel human and loved because a lot of times they don't and um, it's not real hard it's a great way for our church to participate so uh that's limited too so signups are either talk to laura lee write it on uh something and, and put it on the table um or just go online or on your app you can sign up so that's this thursday uh so just heads up on that so we're going to do that in september october we're heading down uh to the orphanage in mexico and we've contacted them. Do we have a date on that? Is that on the website too? On the, or not yet? Not on yet. Okay, we'll get that up. Uh, so, but I mentioned that last week, and a lot of you are like, I want to go to Mexico. Just remember, you got to have a passport. So you got to jump on that if you want to go. That's also limited. We can't take a huge group. So uh, we're going to switch those off. So September, homeless. October, Mexico. November, homeless. So we're going to kind of just have that. So uh, it's going to be a great time. And uh, looking forward to that. In October, just so you know, they have two orphanages, one's with teens, one with little kids. We're going to focus on the little kids in October, and then we're going to hang out with the teenagers in December. So that just so you know, um, if you have one age group you really like, that's kind of what we'll be doing. So check out our website or check out our app for information on that. Also, connection group signups. Um, I believe the Wednesday night group now is, um, you'll be on a waiting list if you sign up for Wednesday night. Still sign up because we might start another group if we get enough people or someone drops, we'll get you in. I believe there's just a few more spots on Thursday. So connection groups start in two weeks. Looking forward to that. It's going to be an amazing time together. We got one happy person. Yeah, two happy people. <laughs> yeah. The rest are like, I don't know. Um, so looking forward to getting into homes and um, it's going to be a great time together, especially as we go through the book of Acts discussing that. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Um, and God, thank you so much that you are someone that pursued us. And God, I pray that we would be people that pursue others with the same type of intentionality and passion. Um, God, thank you for not leaving us lost, leaving us to our own sin, leaving us to our own consequences. Uh, but God, you pursued us out of love. And I pray that that would impact our lives. And as we trust you, we would also go on that same journey with you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Uh, the thesis for today is reaching people disconnected from God. And, and I, I hope you notice that I'm pretty intentional with my words. I don't say Christian, non-Christian, because that word has kind of been so whitewashed in our culture today, you know, uh, of even saying Christian. I like even asking people, are you a Christian or not a Christian? I don't even ask that. It's really interesting when you ask people, are you connected to God or a church? Because that's very specific, right? Are you disconnected or connected? And it's also not as volatile. I notice people, it's like, they don't mind being like, oh yeah, I'm not really connected. Or yeah, you know, I'm not really connected to God. I kind of throw some prayers every once in a while. But if you say Christian, non-Christian, it's almost like, oh, you know, what's, you can kind of ramp things up. But so reaching, reaching people disconnected from God or church is the process, so what do you call it? Outreach missions, reaching people, disconnected from God, is the process of God working in me in order to work through me. Outreach and missions is primarily a work of God. I'm just the vehicle for it. It's not up to my strength and my wisdom. This is huge. This is why we get nervous and fearful. <gasps> what if I say something wrong? What if I do? What if I do? Right? I don't know. What if they say no? What if they don't know? We got all those things. Uh-uh. You're no longer living by faith. You're living by your own intellect and strength and worries. So if I view that as far as like, oh, I am just participating with God. That's all I'm doing. Because of who he is. Because he is a God that works through you or in you in order to work through you. But first he has to work in you. So he's got to transform something. And then he can work through you. That's why we're going to take our time just so you know, because some of us here, six months of outreach, my gosh, how many techniques can we go through, right? It's like, we get it, reach people, I get it, right? 
because we actually have to have a rewiring of our hearts and minds. For some of us, we've never really thought about outreach. Um, others of us, we have a very bad view of it. If I say the word evangelism, some of you break out in hives right now, right? We're going to go do an evangelism thing. You're like, oh, no, like that word's so huge and it's so scary. We have to rewire. That's why we're taking six months. Because God has to work in us as a church before he can work through us. Before we start doing all these activities and let's go reach our city and let's go reach our, our families. Sometimes we start trying to have God work through us, but he hasn't worked in us yet. And, and then that's why it doesn't really work. Or it doesn't sustain. We do it for a couple weeks and then we lose the passion. That's why we're doing this. That's my thesis. Is reaching people disconnected from God is really a God process of him working in me in order to work through me. First, we have to get the heart of God before we can move to be the hands and feet of God. Heart first. Then we can be his hands and feet. What is the heart of God? Luke 19, 10, I think, exemplifies this. Where Jesus says, for the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. He didn't come to start a cool church because there needed to be more cool churches. He didn't come to impress people that they would like him. Like, oh, Jesus, you're really cool. Every day he woke up knowing that his years here were limited with one purpose, that the Father would work in me in order to work through me because he primarily saw people's lost. And this is where the rewiring has to take place. Do you, do you view people who are disconnected from God or church as lost? Where many times the church views people as enemies. Enemies to be fought rather than lost to be found. We see that on social media. We see that in our culture wars. We're fighting the very people that God says, that's who I came for. In Luke 19, don't forget that Jesus was pursuing someone named Zacchaeus. Disconnected from God, a hated person, a tax collector. And that this is where we read that Jesus was known as someone who hung out with sinners, which was not a, a, a good thing back then. They didn't view that as a good thing. I don't know if you've ever been lost. We have these, you know, Google Maps now. So some of you have never experienced being lost. You're like, what is this word lost? Like, what does that mean? Well, back in the 80s, I used to get lost a lot. And so did my family. We had maps. We'd forget maps. Maps would be inaccurate. We got lost. I was with my grandma one time. We were looking for a zoo. This is in, I don't know if it's in like Stockton or Sacramento, but it's up in Central California. But she thought she knew the way. You see, you can be lost and think you know the way. You can be lost and not know you're lost. Sometimes it takes time to figure out that you're lost. But even when you get lost, did you grow up with a, a mom or dad that they didn't like asking for what? Directions. I swear God always brings pe two people together. One wants direction and the other one doesn't. But somehow he brings them together. Right? You ever been in the car with someone? It's like, just pull over and ask someone. I'm not going to ask someone. I remember. You know, like, it's like, my God, just pull the car over, right? My grandma was one of those that, no, I know where the zoo is. I've been here before. And it's like, grandma, it's like 50 years ago you were there, right? We don't know if the zoo still exists. But she knew where the zoo was, right? And her little grandkids weren't going to tell, you know. So we're driving around. If you've ever been in Central California, Sacramento, Stock, like, that's not an area you just drive around, right? It's just like, it's hot. It's nasty. It's like, just pull over and so we're driving around and then and, and when you're lost you don't you don't know it and then you begin to know it but you don't want to admit it but then you start getting frustrated have you ever been lost and all of a sudden this this anger just comes up in you right uncontrolled anger right and so then she starts saying choice words um and uh she, i could tell she's getting anger it's getting awkward in the car because she knows she's lost but she doesn't want to ask for directions there's this internal struggle there so she finally pulls over and uh rolls down the window and there's this lady standing on the side of the road and she says excuse me do you know where the zoo is and the lady says zoo zoo she was on drugs which if you've been in stockton 
it's a 50-50 chance that if you're gonna pull over, you're gonna find someone on drugs in Stockton. So that's, you know. But uh, so she rolled up the window and that didn't work. You see, if you're lost, it's very frustrating when you ask someone for directions and they don't know. If you live in the area, shouldn't you know? If you're going to church and you're a Christian, shouldn't you know the directions? And even worse is giving the wrong directions, right? Have, have you ever done that, pulled over? Oh yeah, make two laughs, that, 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 that. You do it and you're like, that person had no idea. They were just rambling. We finally uh, found a person that was not on drugs and told us where the zoo was. And, and we got to the zoo and the mood changed. She was so relieved. The anger was gone, all those kind of things. Lost. This is how people live. Looking for direction. Where am I going? What's my purpose? And sometimes we get frustrated with a lost person. Can you imagine pulling over? Hey, can, can, excuse me, do you know where the zoo is? Why don't you know what the zoo is? Were you an idiot? No, I just didn't grow up around, you know, what's, what's wrong? Can you imagine them getting angry at you? It's like, I'm just, I'm just lost. Like, who gets mad at a lost person? Nobody does, right? Except is that the view of the church and Christians that they're so mad at people that are lost. And people that are lost, they go the wrong direction. I've done it. I've driven wrong, the wrong way on a one-way road before. <laughs> Oops, oh crud, oh God, what's wrong with you? I don't know where I am. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to... What if you viewed people as lost, needing direction? And when you meet them, maybe they're not ready to hear directions yet. Maybe they don't want to admit they're lost yet. Or maybe that they're angry they're lost. They know they're lost, but they don't have to answer and they don't want to ask because it's humiliating. But we just wait for them to ask. And say, here's the directions. But here's the thing. The reason God has to work in us is because some of us, can we even give directions? How do I find peace? How do I find joy? How do I find hope in conflict and sadness and depression? Jesus. How do I find him? where it starts, how it develops. When you do, there's a confidence then, not a cockiness, but the, a confidence. But before you have that, you view people disconnected as lost, and you have compassion, knowing that once we were lost and found, because that was the mission of Jesus, and it still is today. It changes an environment. Um, I worked in Carlsbad for a while, and um, I worked at a business that uh, during that time, I've shared this story before, so I'm not gonna go into it, but Christine and I went through several miscarriages, and I actually quit ministry and pretty much quit being a Christian. <laughs> uh, I was in a dark place, but I was angry and hurt and exhausted. Well, God did a miracle. Again, I preached on it before, I'll preach on it again, but not right now. Did a miracle, I changed. He, he, Remet me and looked me in the eye and changed me fundamentally as a person. And I remember that walking in the next day, this happened at night, walking in the next day, as soon as I walked in, the secretary, we had two secretaries, both of them said, what happened to you? They could see a physiological difference of who Brian was the day before, angry and bitter uh, towards God and not really listening and following. And the next day where I'm just like, I'm re-giving my life to you. What is wrong with me? Jesus, I'm yours, right? But what was interesting is work fundamentally changed. Where before, I was just like stressed, I wanted more money, why am I not getting a raise, just getting in there, get tasks done, nobody bother me, I'm just kinda like, it's just work, I gotta go into work, I gotta grind. And the next day I was like, ah, I have a missions field. The stress went down, the money, God will figure out the raises. But I was there for a while and impacted nobody for God and within a few weeks, all of a sudden, I started seeing people differently. Their stresses, their anger, their outbursts. Rather than pegging them and their personalities and trying to box them in, I just saw them as lost. And through that, God gave me an amazing opportunity. I was only there for, I think, um, once I gave my life to Christ, I was only there for like six more months, and then I got laid off. 
in those six months, I was able to meet with someone for a, a, a once a week Bible study at lunch. Because as God changed me, he began to work through me. And then one of the IT guys noticed the difference in me and said, what happened, bro? And I used all your guys' different techniques, right? Being real, being vulnerable. We had this miscarriage of this. Can I buy you lunch? So we can, what's one of the ways to impact people? Be generous. Hey, lunch is on me. Let's go. Let's talk. And then ask questions. What's your journey? What's your, you know? And then all of a sudden it's, hey, would you like to open up the Bible and go through Matthew together, right? Yeah, I'd love to do that. I didn't reach everybody in that office, but that wasn't my assignment. You see, everyone has different assignments, but that one guy, that was my assignment. As God worked in me, he was able to work through me. Here's the funny thing. I used no techniques, no evangelism thing, no four steps to coming to know to Christ. I did not, because people realize that comes along with faith. Just be yourself. But what if I say the wrong thing? Yeah, then they'll know you're a human being. How about that? Right? Well, I don't know the whole Bible. I don't think anyone's going to ask you to verbatim say the whole Bible to them, right? They don't want that. But do you know enough of the Bible? Do you have any verse to encourage them, any direction for them? Change work. The stress was different. The excitement was different. It went from a workplace to a missions field. Reaching people disconnected from God is the process of allowing God to work in me in order to work through me. Why? Because if we're Christians, Christ followers, as Jesus came to seek and save the lost, now we're assigned to seek and save the lost. I want to encourage you with this. The only way people can come to know Jesus is through the people in his church. There's no other way. And if the church does not follow through on the opportunity and the responsibility, then we participate in keeping people lost and disconnected from God. That's heavy. Think about that. God works exclusively through his people. Now, does he have to do that? Does God have to do that? No. But he chooses to do it. Why? Because missions and outreach and reaching disconnected people is a partnership that he wants us to bring along so we get to experience what it's like to help someone who is lost to be found because there's nothing more energizing life. I know some of you are like, no, Brian, there's nothing like waking up, having a cup of coffee, reading a Bible verse and underlying it and taking a picture and sending it to Instagram. Like there's nothing like that. Like the peace, right? That, no. There's nothing like a, you know, a worship time, you know, where we're there and we're getting the chills, right? And we're singing and, and, and Pat starts hitting these amazing notes, right? And I get the chills and I start crying. God bless you, Pat. But no, I got something better. <laughs> Sing someone that if their life ended, they would cease to exist. Who's been living their whole life trying to figure it out on their own carrying the weight of finances and relationship and meeting Jesus finding freedom finding joy finding eternal life that's why we read the Bible that's why we have Pat lead us in worship that's why we come to church work in me is not the end result it's the process so he can work through me for the end result that those who are lost will be now we're going to open up the Bible. We've got some verses to go through. Um, I, and I know uh, there's a lot of verses here. Again, you can go online, review things. I know I talk fast, but let me give you the verses if you want to write them down and then I'll read them. And I encourage you to bring your Bibles too. You know, open them up, mark them, circle things. It's a great way to kind of see how God wants to speak to you personally. The passages we'll be going through are in Psalm 96, 1 through 3. Psalm 96, 1 through 3, 1 Peter 3, 15, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20, a couple more, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 through 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 through 21, and then we're going to end with Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 to 38, Matthew chapter 9, 37 to 38. Psalm 96, I just want to remind us 
from the beginning of time, this is what God has always desired. Remember, the Old Testament is not God being angry. He has counseling for a little bit, and then Jesus comes in the New Testament, and he's a lot nicer. Throughout the Old Testament, God's like, Israel, I want, you, I want to use you that other nations would know that I'm a good God. Uh, Psalm 96 says this, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds amongst all people. How do you reach people? Showcase how good God is. Just showcase how good he is. To you, in you, through you, around you. Our world needs to be reminded that God is actually good. <laughs> I think that people, uh, God have, uh, people have a view of God as he's like he's angry and he kind of puts up with us. It's like, ah, I'll get you into heaven if I feel like it, you know, or if you're good enough. Like, don't have too many bad days or I'm going to be angry. It's like, what's the goal of the church is we show how marvelous and gracious and patient and kind and loving and pursuing God is. Declare that, he says, thousands of years ago, that was the goal of God. 1 Peter 3.15 would encourage us with this. Uh, Peter obviously was a close disciple of Jesus, so I think he understands the heart of God. And, and he says this to us. He says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And with that, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Oh, does the church need this in a time like today? How about we speak with gentleness and respect towards people who are lost? Not condescending, not judgmental, of gentleness and respect. But he says, listen, as how, how do we get this faith to kind of work in us and to work through us? The first thing is, be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. Do you know the reason for your faith? Why are you a follower of Jesus? Do you have a story to tell? Do you have a verse that's meant something to you? Sometimes I believe the reason we are apprehensive for God to work through us is just because we're not prepared. And if you're not prepared, that's scary to anything in life. Have any of you started a job or tried to do a job where you didn't feel prepared? You're probably pretty nervous, right? You weren't prepared for that. I didn't have all the tools. So one of the things that we're going to be working on, just you know, as we go through Acts, is preparing your testimony. Do you know if someone asks you, why are you so joyful? Why do you go to church? Why do you stay married to that person? Why are you so loving here? It's more than just like, oh, I don't know, you know, just, you know, I kind of grew up in a good home, you know, or you just, you know, oh, I, you know, I go to Access Church and like that. That's fine, tell them about church, but I'd rather you tell them about Jesus in church, just so you know. Just so you know, I hope Access Church, the name never gets elevated above. I just want to tell you about Jesus. But I'm like, oh, you just got to come to our church. Because the likelihood is they're not going to come to church until they have some good interaction or understanding with Jesus. Now, if that happens, great. But why don't we introduce them to Jesus rather than to Access? Are you prepared? Here's the other thing is, are we even living a life where they would ask us that question? So when I go to work, they're stressed but do I have a peace and a joy that attracts them to be like, we're all cursing and gossiping about our boss and you're not. Now, not the whole group probably won't ask you, but there'll be that one that while everyone's gossiping and you're not, there'll, there'll be something. Because why? Because here's the thing. You got to remember that if God wants you to reach someone, he's already working on them before you even talk to them. Why are you nervous? Oh my God, I got to bring them to Christ. Are you insane? You ain't bringing anyone to Christ. What's wrong with you? You'll mess it up. But if God is working in me, or through me, and if he's already working on them, checkmate, homie, you're going down. Once I see a seed is planted in someone, I'm like, oh my God, you're done. You're done. And I'll tell them that. Yeah, you're going to become a Christian soon. Well, hey, you know, done. Nah, done, dude, done. The seed's planted. I can't even mess it up. God's already working, right? Then it gives me an excitement. It gives me an excitement, right? To be like, oh, now I'm just going to take people down. I'm just going to take them down, right? I'm not nervous because God's already working on them. 
But are you prepared? Have you thought it through? Are you ready to go into work? And I, I have answers of joy. I have Bible verses. I have stories. Ah, I'm ready, right? Matthew uh, 28 goes on to say that we even have a, a clear directive from God. It's when he's talking to his 11 disciples. This is after the resurrection, right? And um, they were worshiping him. And it says that this is what he said in one of his final words to the disciples were this. Listen, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me, not to you, not to me, but to Jesus. So Jesus has all the authority, right, from heaven and earth. He said, therefore, since he has the authority, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and also teaching them. We're not just reaching people, then we teach them. Some of us reach someone, they're like, Brian, now you take them from here. Oh, you're a leader, you go do it. Uh, no, boom, I put them back to you. No, if God used you, God has other people for me. You teach them. Well, I, do, I, do, I don't know the Bible that well. We'll get to know the Bible well then because you're going to teach someone. The goal isn't just to be like, oh, go to my church. There's a flyer and run away. The goal is now disciple them. Guide them. I don't have all the answers. Go find the answers then. That's why we're here as a church. We can talk to each other and encourage one another. He says, this is the goal of every Christian, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always. Check that out. He's with us always to the end of the age. He has all the authority. We don't. But he's with us. Oh, if God is with me, then who can be against me, right? It's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. But he said, go to all nations. So one of the things we want to do as a church is, is not just worry about the people that are around us, but some of us in this room, I, I would love this as a church. I think God's going to send some of us away from here. And I think some of us are scared. We hold on to the American dream. We hold on to relationships too tight. We hold on to money too tight. But God wants to send us. Not the person sitting next to you, but you. And we got to hit all the nations. And here's where I want to encourage you, some of you that are scared. Maybe we, as we go through the book of Acts, we'll find out who God's speaking to. He's not going to send everyone. Some of us need to be the sender, right? Um, but God has a specific city or a, spe a specific village or a specific group for you. And he might send you around the world. And here's where I want to encourage you is I found that cross-cultural evangelism or outreach is actually usually easier than trying to do it at home. I've brought more people to Christ in Africa and in India than I have here. And just so you know, it's pretty normal because even Jesus said what? A prophet is not honored in his own town. Jesus had an easier time reaching people away from his hometown than in his hometown. In fact, his family was one of the last ones to become a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So some of you that are scared, it's like, no, 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 no. This is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, 37 through 38, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's people in India right now. There's people in China right now. There's people in Africa right now. There's people all over the world that God's already working on them, but it's going to take a different voice than the people around them. I've been blown away. I remember when, when I'm, uh, I've been to India twice. I remember one of the trips, they're like, well, just tell your story. I'm like, why would they care about my story? Some suburban kid in California, and like, these are farmers, and like, I have nothing, you know. I'm like, this, they're just going to be like, dude, you're a whiner. Like, that's what I felt like. But again, do, that's doing it my own strength. So the Holy Spirit rebuked me, like, uh-uh, I'm working in you to work through you. So don't worry about your story. Try to share my story. People are crying. It's crazy. Boom, how many people want to accept Christ? Seven people. Awesome. Super pumped. The harvest is ripe or plentiful, but the workers are few. He says, ask the Lord uh, of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. I'd love to be a church where we are sending people out to the harvest. That's why we got you guys so much, and uh, we had a great time sharing about Young Life before, but that's why we're so passionate about getting Young Life going. These guys are on campuses. These guys are, are at their living with those that are a lot right there. High school is ripe. Junior high is ripe. No, they got phones. They got this. They're distracted. No. 
We need to send Christians. We need to support them. And that's why we support them financially. We want to support them on missions, uh, the camps, right? We're able to support. You know, that money is just a way to send people and to impact lives. Second Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 5, a great perspective for us. He says in verse 11, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. And by the way, when we say these words, some of you are like, oh, man, you know, I don't want to persuade anyone. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You persuade people all the time, right? If you find a good restaurant, do you keep it yourself? I'm not I'm telling nobody about this. No. You have good pizza, you're like, I'm going to post this. I'm going to tell people this is where you have to eat, right? You do that. You manipulative little sucker, right? Tell me where to eat pizza. How dare you tell me where to eat pizza? Mind your own business. We don't say that. Nobody says that. Oh, you got to check this place out. Shut your mouth. I'm going to Taco Bell. Don't you ever talk about pizza again. Like, we don't do that. Yeah, we persuade people all the time, right? You have this new meal plan. Dude, I'm on this new meal plan. I only eat peas and meat. That's it, man. It's this new way of keto living that our, you know, great, great grandfathers used to do. You know, we harvest nuts in the winter. You know, I lost so much weight. What do you do? You tell everybody about it, right? We persuade all the time. Why then someone that frees me from my sin, gives me eternal life, gives me hope, gives me love, gives me purpose, why would I keep that to myself? No, nah, come on now. And if people say like, dude, you're trying to persuade me. Yes, I am. Good call. You're very observant. Yes, I'm here to persuade. Exactly. Why? Verse 14 in 2 Corinthians says, for Christ's love compels us. This is working in me. Some of us, when I talk about outreach, you're like, oh. And what I would say is actually right now, don't reach anyone. Just chill. Because God needs to work in me. Because for some reason, I'm lacking the heart of God. Because I have the heart of God when I can't wait to impact other people. So when I lack that desire, just so you know, I'm not calling out saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying there's a heart issue there. Because I'm compelled by the love of, I'm compelled. He's moving me forward because I'm so stoked about what God is doing in me or through me. And by the way, this is why it's important for a lot of us to work through our own sin and shame and things like that. Because some of us are so stuck on lacking the grace of God in our lives that we can't extend it to other people. I really encourage you to work through that. You're fully forgiven. Like the blood of Jesus covers all sins. I don't deserve it. Exactly. That's why we're so stoked. We don't deserve it. And so then you can properly give a gospel to someone else that is trying to, they're lost, but they're trying to find, it on, find Jesus on their own. You can't. It's undeserved grace and love. But the problem is when I'm so stuck on my own sin and shame, I don't see other people because I'm looking at myself. That's why we want to work through that so I can look up saying like, I know there's things there, but it's covered by the blood of Jesus. I can then look at other people. This is why it's important because his love compels us. Though, so if I lack being compelled, usually what that means is I'm lacking the love of God in my own heart. Does that make sense? So there's a little bit of a process here. He says, we are convinced that he died for all. And if he died for all, then those who live should no longer live for themselves, but to him who died for them. We live for Jesus because he died for us so that we don't have to die. So now I'm compelled. His love compels me. I'm so stoked. Verse 16, he says, so now we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Now I view people differently. I don't view them as Democrat, Republican. I don't view them as enemy. I don't view them as nationality. I don't view them by their behaviors. Oh, you're in that group. You're in this group. That's a worldly point of view. He says, though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do not know it. Uh, we do not so any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. Living for money, living for myself, categorizing people. No, that's the old thing. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. He doesn't count people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 
so now when God works in me in order to work through me, he's not just changing my view of other people, he's changing his view of you. Do you view yourself as an ambassador of Jesus to people? I don't know if you know what an ambassador is, but we have ambassadors. I don't know if you know that. We have ambassadors. You know what they do? They go to other nations, and what do they do? They represent America to other nations. Do you know what also is given to them, though? The authority to speak on behalf of the United States. Do you view yourself as an ambassador? that you represent Jesus. So here's the challenge for the church today. When the church gets mad at the, at, at the world, they don't want to accept Christ. Is it the world's fault? Or is it we don't represent Jesus that has any appeal at all to them? Here's the other thing, cool thing too, is you've been given the authority to speak on behalf of Jesus. But with that, I encourage you this, speak well. Don't misspeak. How do I do that? Get in the word of God. Because when the word of God is in me, I'm going to speak clearly on the behalf of Christ to others. You are an ambassador. So now the view of other people isn't just changed. The view of myself has changed. So he says this, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's an article in the Christian Post on September 1st, because I want to encourage you with this as we wrap up. We've got to get out of our mind I think we do this subconsciously maybe, that we kind of have an idea of who's going to become a Christian and who isn't, right? We kind of have an idea of like, oh, I could see them being a Christian. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Like, oh, I, I could see them being a Christian. Then other people are like, I just don't see it. I don't know how that's going to happen, right? And you're like, I would never do that consciously. Like, I'd never share that if I got you guys in a group. Like, who do you think is not going to be a Christian this week? Like, you, you would not share that at church. But deep in your heart, you're like, ah, you know. I can't imagine that jerk. I can't imagine that. Well, if they vote for who, they'll never be a good, right? We kind of do that. No one is outside the grasp and the love and the pursuit of God. And as an ambassador, he might send you to places that you don't want to go or can't imagine you're going to go, but he's going to use you to represent him to reach others. On September 1st, the Christian Post interviewed author Caleb uh, Kaltenbach who once found himself saying in the article, I never want to be a Christian, but a blatant attempt to try and disprove the Bible left him in the most surprising of circumstances. Dang it, he accepted Christ, and God transformed his heart and mind in the process. But let me give you his journey. Uh, Kaltenbach's uh, faith journey and theological views are especially surprising considering he was raised by three gay parents in an activist environment before his conversion. My parents divorced when I was two, and they both jumped into same-sex relationships. The journey led Kaltenbach and his family into, two, into years of pro-LGBT activism where he often encountered hate and anger from those who called themselves Christians, people who left him feeling in his early years as though he'd never want to put his faith in that type of God. He said, I learned quickly, uh, I learned real quick from things that I saw in pride parades. The way uh, and how I saw Christians treat people the way I saw families ignore their young sons dying from AIDS, this was in the 80s. And I remember that too. The church was... I saw real quick that Christians hated gay people. And I thought to myself, I never want to be a Christian. What's the chances of a guy like this being reached for Jesus? In our minds, we'd say, good luck, dude. And God's like, mm -mm. there's no wall I won't climb. Nothing will stop me. And when you have that view, I'll go to a parade if I have to go to a parade. I'll go to a bar if I have to go to a bar. I'll go to the family barbecue if I have to go to a family barbecue. <laughs> because I'm an ambassador. And who knows what God's doing in someone's heart that might spark a conversation or they view a Christian in a different way. Because imagine this guy. He's viewed Christians a certain way. Can you imagine the first loving compassionate Christian he runs into. It's got to throw him for a loop. Like, what the heck? Well, it happened in his teen years. He was invited to a Bible study. Oh, you're going down, dude. He was 16, but he wanted to disprove Christianity to this youth group. He's like, yeah, I'll get these Christians. They don't know what they're doing. He didn't realize, remember, sometimes lost people don't know they're lost. 
It says that in his uh, efforts, though, he was shocked to find himself actually captivated by the scriptures. And he goes, I became a Christian. He goes, the journey wasn't easy, especially when his family found out of his conversion. His parents actually kicked him out of the house, but they later reconciled. I think my parents realized eventually that I was not one of those Christians, referring to the angry people. His faith journey didn't stop there, though. He decided to, be, uh, to go into ministry and become a pastor. And also years later, both his parents would become Christians. You never know what God's doing. So don't limit him. Don't undercut him. Do not discount or dismiss the movement of God because it's what changes the world one person at a time. So this is the journey we're on the next six months that God's going to work in us. And for some of us, he still has to work in us, but not, that's not the end game in order to work through us because that's when life gets exciting. Because if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, the Naxos Church, our goal isn't nice air conditioning, nice worship ministries, everybody's on a ministry team, everybody's nice and perfect, nobody sends anymore, we're all now, we keep, you know, greet each other with the holy kiss, it's this perfect little church. No, no, no. The goal is we're going to be a messy, messy church, but we're on movement because as God works in us, he works through us. We're going to take time now, and um, I just want to encourage you to let God speak to you now, begin to move you, and maybe even lay some people on your hearts and mind that he wants you to begin to pray for and begin to reach. I think these next six months are going to be exciting and he's going to surprise you with how he uses you. I know for some of you like, I don't know if I want him to use me. You do. It's an exciting journey. There's nothing better than seeing someone who's lost get it and be found. Through this process, we're going to take communion. Uh, go ahead and come on up here, uh, Pat and uh, Aiden. Um, and as we worship, um, I encourage you that as you take communion, here's what I'd love for you to do today. As you take communion, can you thank God for how he's loved you? And then as you take communion, can maybe one or two of you, if you do it in a group, but can you pray for people that you'd like to see them take communion? People that haven't experienced the love of God. So maybe in communion, we thank God, but also this kind of commissions us to be on mission for him, to be an ambassador for him. And maybe pray that their lives are covered by the blood of Jesus too. Jesus, um, I thank you for the ambassadors that you sent in my life because I was an angry, rebellious, confused, and hurt young man. Um, I realized that left to my own, I should be dead or in jail, no doubt. I, I realized that left on my own, I would be divorced multiple times with my kids not knowing me. I realized that I'd have very bad friendships. So God, I thank you for my mom who's an ambassador. Thank you for my soccer coaches. Man, I drove them crazy, and they were amazing ambassadors. I think for the youth pastor who was an ambassador when I was saying dumb things in high school, but he just loved me. I thank you for Dan Wanigan, who was an ambassador. God, I pray that someday someone prays to you and thanks to you for us being an ambassador to them. May today commission us, excite us, and compel us to reach those who are disconnected from you. We worship you now in your name, Jesus. Amen. Jesus, I say, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection that we I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe. sing an old song, an old hymn, a beautiful hymn. And there's so many words and phrases in this song that speak to our hearts and hopefully draw us closer to the Lord. But just want to bring up one of these words that might throw you for a loop, and that is the phrase, here I raise mine Ebenezer. You might wonder, wow, what's an Ebenezer? Well, simply put, it is from the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel, where uh, in chapter 7, and they talk about an Ebenezer. And it simply said, it's, it's a stone of help. 
So as you sing that word, hopefully it helps you understand a little bit of what you're singing as you sing this song. Let's sing it. Come thou fountain, every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song. Some from flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Bow to thy redeeming love. Here I raise my heaven. Hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. To rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Yeah. Oh, to raise how great a debtor daily. Thy goodness like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Yes, Lord, do that today. Speak to our hearts, God, and change us today. Yes. As we sing this last song, I want to invite you to stand up. A lot of words we're asking God to change us into the people that He wants us to be. But most importantly, to allow Him to lead us in His love to those around us. Let's sing this together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever pray. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Jesus, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
about you guys, but I'm excited because if Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, it's not about the harvest. It's about the workers getting out of their seats and saying, we got a job to do. And it's really an exciting job because there's no pressure on you. You're just being an ambassador. You don't have any authority. Jesus has it all. And he's already preparing people. Some of us are going to plant seeds this week. Awesome. Some of us, we're going to harvest this week. Awesome. We're all on the same team. And it's all a journey of faith. So if you plant seeds, plant in faith that they'll grow. If you harvest, harvest in faith. It's exciting. It's an opportunity that's before us. Some of us are thinking, you know, but I'm not a missionary. We've got to change our mindset. Yeah, you are. Some of you might be called to India. Some of you might be called to Africa. Some to the inner city. Some of you, you're called to your home because the first mission field is your kids. Some of you are called to schools. Some of you are called to your jobs. Some in your neighborhoods. The mission field, the harvest is all out there. It's the workers that Jesus needs. So I just pray we'd be a faithful church. I'm excited. These next six months, I'm praying for you guys. Pray for each other, but also pray for those that God will work on their hearts. And that you get to be a part of an unbelievable miracle of someone dying to themselves and rising to you in Christ, just like you did. So I hope you guys are encouraged. I hope you have a great week um, and that God uses you powerfully. And look forward to next week, jumping into the book of Acts, get to it. Connection group start in two weeks if you're not in it. Sign up ASAP and uh, we'll get this thing going, you guys. All right, take care. Again, if you could grab your chairs, throw it on there. We really appreciate it. Take care. Thanks for joining us. For more resources, to get involved, or to invest in the ministries at Access Church, visit go to Take care.